You're listening to the Straits of Video Podcast with Rob Lane. What's going on? Hope all is great and welcome along to my show, Straight to Video. I'm your host, Rob Lane, and today I am super happy to bring you a chat with one of Hard Rock's finest vocalists, Mitch Malloy, a guy who since releasing his debut self-titled album back in 1992 has been on quite the journey and still looks and sounds as cool as he did some 30 years ago. Now, I vividly remember seeing Mitch crop up on the pages of Metal Edge magazine and thinking, who is this guy? It was unusual to see a solo singer in amongst all the Poison and Warrant star bands. I figured he'd perhaps been in another band before, or was he a new Richard Marks or Brian Adams? On more of a deeper dive, I think the record label was planning on the latter, and from what I can figure out, they had seen the writing on the wall for Hard Rock in the early 90s, so launching someone as a solo star should have given him a better shot. The rumble from Seattle, though, I guess, had other plans. Mitch, though, continued as a musical force. More albums followed, along with an amazing career behind the scenes in Nashville, working behind the desk with the likes of Kenny Loggins, Taylor Swift, and Boys Like Girls. On today's podcast, Mitch and I talk all about his brand new album, The Last Song, which is out on July the 7th. Plus, we dive into Mitch's past, including his move to New York in the 80s, becoming friends with Bruno Ravel of Danger Danger. Plus, we chat about Mitch's one-of-a-kind Van Halen experience show. Some of you listening might immediately be thinking, wait, what has this Mitch Malloy guy got to do with Van Halen? Well, Mitch was actually offered the lead singer gig in Van Halen following Sammy Hagar's departure in the mid-90s. This was before Extreme's Gary Sharon came on board and it's all put to tape in the great YouTube documentary Van Halen's Lost Boy, which I urge you to check out. Personally, as a big Van Halen fan, I think this could have been amazing and I would have loved to have seen it happen, but if you watch the documentary, you'll understand the valid reasons why it wasn't meant to be. This straight video podcast is proudly presented to you in association with Affinity Photo, which is an incredible piece of photo editing software which I've been using for graphic design the past couple of years. It's used to create the podcast episode artwork you see each week with the core cool video cassette. And it's an extremely affordable alternative to other programs on the market. So if you have time, please check them out at affinity.serif.com. All right, let's dive into this. Mitch proved to be as awesome on the show as I hoped, and there was so much other stuff I wanted to chat to him about, but as he's on the promo run for the last song, time was tight, but this was still a blast. Please check out mitchmalloy.com for how to get your hands on the new album. But right now, please enjoy my straight-to-video talk with Mitch Malloy. How are you, sir? I'm good, man. Just, you know, working, working, working. It never stops. It's all good. Better to be working than like trying to find something to do. Yes, that really sucks. I hate that. Well, we're at a time now where if anyone says they're bored, they need to just get out of here because there's so much stuff to be done. It's crazy. Isn't that the truth? When somebody says to you, I'm bored, you just look at them and like, really? (laughs) What's that like? (laughs) Okay. What do you got? All righty. So I'm coming to you from near Nottingham, which I know you're familiar with Nottingham in the UK. Nottingham is my favorite place in the UK, actually. Careful, you'll piss people off. Well, you know, because of Rock City, I had the most fun I've ever had in England in Nottingham. So, you know, I did two shows there and those were my two best shows in England. It's always been a rock town, always been a rock and roll town. And if I'm pissing off the rest of the UK, oh, well, (laughs) sorry. The rest of the UK needs to bring it. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Were you at those Rock City shows? If not, then... Mm. Very strangely, I've actually spent my 30th birthday at a Mitch Malloy gig and my 40th birthday at a Mitch Malloy gig, which is really weird. <laughs> wow. Okay, so how old are you now? <laughs> it's my 50th next year. So if you've got any UK shows coming up, <laughs> I'll make sure I'm Maybe at it. Maybe <laughs> we need to plan that. Your birthday bash. It'd be really friggin' strange if that worked out. That'd be really weird. Yeah, birthday bash. The Mitch Malloy show. Rob's birthday bash. <laughs> Everyone be there. I'm in. It's better than Firefest. Wow. That's the quote. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pulling that. I'm ripping that audio. Better than Firefest. Yeah. Sorry, everybody. So you still living out in Destin, Florida, Mitch? Yeah, but I don't really announce that because I'm so mega famous that people will bother me. I do have some... Um, 
stalkers all oh, right occasionally <laughs> i used to have vacations out in destin florida and i remember foot pucker's restaurant <laughs> that's all i remember about destin florida wow you weren't at my place that's for sure now i'm going back to the late 80s yeah well you were obviously very smart back then what happened how come you haven't been back i don't know it's just my dad lives out in mississippi so um we used to take road trips to Destin, Florida. So it was kind of like the closest part of Florida to Mississippi. Yes, it's close to Mississippi, which is good. It keeps us, you know, exclusive. Didn't you do your Mitch Malloy Van Halen experience out there? That looked like an insanely yeah. big production. Thank you. It was insanely big. And if you ask everyone involved, they will point at me and say, yes, he is insane. Fair enough. That was the goal. The goal was, OK, well, if I'm going to do a Van Halen show, I'll probably do one in my life and this will be it and let's do it huge let's go for it let's give people as much of an experience of van halen without van halen actually being there not easy to do without van halen being there and which rehearsal went into that was everybody involved kind of like top of the game anyway so you could get away with minimal rehearsals or was there as a lot involved well the band i chose were all session guys so i knew that they would come prepared everybody prepared extensively prior to arriving here to rehearse. So we booked three days of rehearsal and then the show. I rehearsed for a month prior. I had all the backing tracks that I was singing to. That was an interesting venture because it was like, for me to sing Dave songs is a lot crazy. You know, I'm a first tenor and Dave's a baritone, yeah. which is two registers below me. And he is not a standard singer, let's say. Dave is a genius. I would say Dave is a genius vocalist on those records. And so it was really crazy, a crazy undertaking for me, but it was a fun challenge. It was fun. It looked spectacular. Like I say proper production. Everything was just massive. Yeah, we went for it. We pulled out all the stops and uh, we, we booked in all the production. And But just the preparation for it for me was really, really crazy. And, and it took me a few days to get over the hump of just being terrible. You know, just like the first couple of days was like, oh, my God, this is going to suck. What am I going to do? And I just worked and worked and worked at it and got it to the point where it was honoring singing Dave's songs, Dave's melodies and kind of his phrasing. But with my voice, you know, it was really, really fun. Once I got over the hump of not being terrible and being just OK and like, OK, this is how it's going to sound. And I think I kind of like this. This like sort of working but tons of rehearsal if it was fun that's mission accomplished because a van halen show has to be fun oh, job done <laughs> absolutely we had so much fun i mean when you see that production i mean i was already you know four years in with great white doing that level of work right so i was used to a certain level a really nice level of you know, production and stages. And then we just took it to another level. So for me, like I was on the stage, it was funny because I'm on the stage and I'm just doing my thing and I'm having a blast and it sounds great because the band is amazing. And we had this massive runway. I would go down that runway and when I would turn around to come back to the stage, it was like I was at Disneyland. I was like, holy shit, looking around at the stage and going, wow, we did it. Look at this stage. It's huge. Right now, we have the new album, the last song. Great to have new Mitch Malloy solo material out there. And there's a real swagger to this record. And your voice is just insane. Do you have to continually work hard at keeping those vocal chops up? Or have you been one of those lucky vocalists over the years? I want to say lucky. You know what I mean? Some guys, they've managed to keep it up there. There are some artists that, you know, maybe weren't given a lot and they had to work at it. And really, I respect them a ton because they did work at it and they wanted it so bad. And then, but I'm not one of those. I was born a singer. Right. So I just was born with this gift. Now, does that mean that I can just open my mouth at any given time and sing crazy good? No, no. So I was born with it. Yes. But it is taken away from me if I don't you know, really cultivate and work at it. I mean, I go for months at a time without singing a note. You know, before I was with Great White, I always did that because I was in the studio working on other people and other things. And then I'm making my own record and there's a point where you're singing, but then that point is over and then you're doing everything else as I do. Right. So I am used to going for months and months and months without singing a note. 
And when I do that and I come back, I am crap. It's a muscle though, isn't it? That's what they say. It's a muscle. Yeah. Do not be jealous of me because I have the ability and mostly am utter crap. <laughs> yes. Truth. No, somebody actually, an English friend of me just said, I was playing him some of my new stuff, you know, because I'm always working on new stuff. And he's like, your voice, man. I'm like, what? I just, I haven't sung in months. And I just did that vocal like off the cuff. I'm not even in good voice. And he goes, you're Mitch Malloy. You're always in good voice. And I'm like, no, that is not true. The songs that jumped out to me were, I'll find a way. You're the brightest star. I really like those two. But I was floored by using this song. I'm presuming that's written for your daughter. Uh, using this song is, I would say, Jen generally for my wife. And yes, it can like bleed over into my daughter for sure. I mean, those two girls are my life, you know, so I've noticed that. I'll notice like I'm writing a song and I'm thinking, oh, this one's definitely about faith. And then I'll get a little deeper into it. And I'm like, hey, I think maybe this song's about Eden too. So yeah, that happens, you know, when you're a husband and a father, that's going to happen, you know, but I appreciate you saying swagger. Nobody has said that yet. And I appreciate Appreciate. I like that word a lot. Thank you. Could I ask how becoming a dad changed your perspective on your career and life goals? Was it like this huge tomb shift? Oh my God. Are you a dad? No. Oh no. Okay. <laughs> That's why I'm asking. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> right. So, so check this out. So I was on the phone with my brother, which is rare. And he was super chatty, which is even more rare. And so I was really enjoying speaking to my brother and we were on the phone for quite a long time. We were in, still in Nashville then. And I was up in my studio. I say up because there were steps to get up into the studio from the house. And my wife kept coming up to the studio. And I just would look at her like, you know, she knew I was on the phone. And she clearly wanted to tell me something. And I wanted to stop, but my brother was like on a roll. And so I kept looking at her like, I can't. You know, and so she would turn around and leave and then she would come back. So the third time I was just hanging up with my brother and I looked up and I saw this look on her face and my life changed in that moment. I knew what she was going to say. And I just looked at her and she looked at me and I, nothing even really needed to be said. It was just like nodding kind of thing. And my life changed in a way that I cannot describe, but I would imagine most other fathers know exactly what I mean, right? My whole life changed. Everything, energy, everything. The moment you become a father, everything changes. Everything that was important is no longer important. I'm not sure about that, but there's just some kind of a profound change that happens to you that is kind of like an oh shit moment. Like it's great, but it's also terrifying. Those two things combined. That's why you can't really describe it because something happens to you that's never happened to you before. And I do love the message to the title track. Ah. Living your life like it's the last song. I know people said, oh, is this the last Mitch Malloy album and all this kind of thing. But in the lyrics you say, like, living your life like it's the last song. Is that something you've carried through your career? Everything you seem to do has like this real quality control about it. It's always presented so well with so much passion. People always say, like, when you do a show, always play like it's an arena, whether there's 10 people there or 100 people. That's something I've always took on when I'm playing a gig. Is that something that's always been important to you and reflected in this song? So are you saying that I influenced you in a good way? No, it's something. It's just, no, just agree with me, Rob. Just say yes, Mitch. <laughs> you're my hero. Yeah. So, yeah, you're the first person to get that actually yeah <laughs> yeah a lot of firsts today on the rob uk podcast what is this podcast called <laughs> well it's called straight to video even though there's no video yeah you're wacky dude come on <laughs> now i love my vhs tapes that's where it came from <laughs> yeah okay now everyone's got a podcast which has video i'm like damn it you can have those vhs tapes. you can have the cassettes you can have everything tape you can have it all i want nothing to do with it yeah so what was the question? <laughs> the theme of the last song. It's not like a swan song for Mitch Malloy. It's about the way you approach things, like living your life like it's the last song. Like this might be the last song you play, I'm guessing, or you've got to give everything 110%, I'm presuming. Yes. Good presumption there, lad. Yeah. So I'm living my life like it's a, you know, people are like, Mitch, you got to tell me this isn't the last song. And I'm like, did you listen to the freaking song? The chorus goes, I'm living my life 
like it's the last song. Does that sound like it's the last song to you? <laughs> so no, it's not. I mean, I hope, I mean, but you never know, right? I tell you what, it's the last song. If people don't buy it, come on, let's be real. I can't keep doing this unless, you know, it helps feed my family. Exactly. Well, like the previous album, Making Noise, you played all the instruments on the new record. Who's your sounding board for when it comes to new material, when you're doing it yourself? Do you have someone who you can trust to send it to for feedback? Or you're like, no, this is great. It's going out as it is. Yeah, I have only myself. That's why when I finish a record, I'm like, it's the hugest oh shit moment ever. Because the first person that hears it, you're like freaking out because it's only you that's heard it. From the first song you wrote till the last mix you finished, till the last, you know, mastering that you did. And then boom, there it is. It's finished. Okay, shit. Okay, now I got to let somebody else hear it. Oh, no. You know, and most people think that I'm sending things to people and asking them what they think, but I'm not doing that. I am completely self-contained, completely making all the calls myself. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of work, but I took a long time on this record. Not as long as you might think, though. I mean, this record's been done for six months. It's dusty. It's funny. And I only know that because yesterday I had to go look at a folder because somebody was asking me a question about something technical. And I saw that it was six months that I made that finished folder. So it's, yeah, it's been done for half a year. You wouldn't send it to Bruno Ravel then for feedback because he's the king in the studio too. Yeah. And he's my bro. That's what I mean. I wonder if he might be one of the guys who's in the trusted circle. He absolutely is in the trusted circle, but I don't have a trusted circle. But if I was going to do that with somebody, it would be him because I completely trust him. He's brilliant. He does all the same stuff that I do. You know, he does it his way. I do it my way. And I think we have a mutual respect. And we have a, a great friendship. Yeah. I mean, he's being very encouraging, actually, in this moment. And we both have a record out, you know, so we're both yeah. kind of giving each other crap about how platinum our records are going to go. How far do you and Bruno go back? Was he someone on the East Coast, like New York scene when you moved there in the 80s? Yeah, we joke about that because he says we met like in the 80s and I don't remember meeting him in the 80s. <laughs> And he's like, yeah, that's because you're a lead singer. Like, exactly. <laughs> and you're just a bass player. Why would I remember you? <laughs> it's a joke, people. I'm a bass player, too. Yeah, we met a long, long time prior. I, I do give him crap, too, that I could have been in his band. Like, I'm like, well, you could have asked me to be in your band, you know, asshole. <laughs> but he's like, I didn't even know who you were then. I'm like, oh, I thought you did know who I was. Get the story straight, Bruno. So I think I actually opened for them. They got to the starting line way before I did. So Bruno is just way smarter than I am, I think. Yeah. So we were friendly, but we weren't pals. We became friends after my record came out. It's funny because I was walking with my girlfriend in New York City one day. It was morning. we just gotten up and we were headed out to go grab some breakfast. And I was crossing the street and I hear, yo, Mitch Malone. Dude. And I look over and there's this little sports car thing. And there's Steve West and Bruno in this little sports car, like out the window, go bitch for the like pointing to me. And I was like, I didn't even really know them. I knew who they were. I'm like, hey, this is the danger, danger guy. I'm like, hey. I, like I waved to them and they took off. And I never even spoke to them, but that's a very clear memory to me. And then we became friends, I think, later when I moved to Nashville. He wanted to talk to me because he was considering moving to Nashville. And then we discovered that we had like everything in common. Like it was insane how much shit we had in common. And we got married at the same time. We had a kid at the same time. Our kids are the same age. Like it's like crazy. Awesome. But you'd grown up in North Dakota. And if I'm right, you're from a pretty big family, like the youngest of six kids. Is that right? Yeah. Youngest of six and a half kids, actually. <laughs> my, my brain's yeah, like going. I know. I have a brother that we found out about later on. Oh, wow. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So he's the oldest boy, actually. How was that for you to be heard as like the youngest? Was music your voice back then? Was that what got you the attention? I wasn't heard. No? Not really. No. I was the youngest kid, so I was pretty quiet. Still am, believe it or not. I mean, I'm super mouthy right now, but I'm generally don't say much. And I kind of grew up like that. Because I was the youngest kid, and so I was the baby. I think when I started singing, people paid attention. It's funny. That's the first time my dad ever really, really, really acknowledged me when I was nine. And I sang in church. I sang a solo in the service because the choir didn't have a female that could hit the notes. 
So they heard that I was a singer. So they called me and I came in. And so I'm in, you know, this church, very reverby kind of, you know, and I'm singing like soprano boy voice. And my dad was so proud. So on the way home in the car, he was like, Mitchell, that was fantastic. I'll never forget that moment. Like my dad noticed me. Wow. Did your elder siblings introduce you to a lot of cool music or take you to any shows? They didn't take me to any shows because I come from a very small town. There weren't any shows. Right. But yeah, all the music, you know, I was introduced to the Beatles in diapers. My mom said you were dancing before you could walk. She says that about me. So I just loved the Beatles and I grew up on the Beatles, basically. Yeah. And all their music, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, the Stones, all that stuff that happened. And then I just continued on. I have another sister uh, is the youngest girl and she got into David Bowie. So I was exposed to that. And then, you know, just all the Aerosmiths and, you know, ZZ Top. I remember the first time I ever heard ZZ Top. It was Tush. I'm like, whoa, listen to that guitar. And Billy's probably my favorite guitar player of all time. Who took you to your first concert? It was Hart, right? Hart, yeah. Yeah, I actually went with my buddy Tim, uh, Tim Wheeler, who was in the Malloy band. We started pretty much together. I started singing and playing guitar and he was my best pal. And so he started singing and playing guitar. And he said to me last year, we were on the phone and he goes, you know, I never really thank you for teaching me how to sing. And I'm like, ah, whatever, dude. He goes, no, really. I learned how to sing by watching and listening to you sing. And when we sing together, it's pretty powerful stuff, actually, still to this day. So you've been friends right from the beginning of your career right to present day. Yeah, we grew up together, right? So we met when we were five, I think. Yeah, and he moved to New Jersey. He was a large reason that I moved to New Jersey because he was going to Princeton. I wonder that because you studied in Seattle, but then you did the move to the East Coast and not Los Angeles and stuff like that. So was that one of the reasons that you hit New York? Yeah, there was a pull, obviously, for me to go to L.A., but my father didn't want me to go to L.A. He was, I think, afraid for me to go to L.A. So he thought New York was way better for some reason. Like, it was more, like, cool. It was New York. So he thought that was cooler. So when I said, how about New York? He said, yeah. So he was supportive of that. Tim was already out there going to Princeton. So I had to save up some money, you know, to be able to do the move. And I bought a Volkswagen van and loaded up my guitars and my amps and which I had very few of at the time. I wouldn't have been able to do that now. <laughs> but I had to rent a U-Haul just for the guitars. Going back to quickly to um, music you was introduced to, one thing I think is cool and a bit of a full circle pinch me thing is that didn't you hear the debut Van Halen album way before anybody else because you found like a pre-release copy in a record store? That's slightly askew. Yeah, how the story goes is I didn't hear it before it came out, okay? The story is my little town, we had one record store, like a mom and pop little store, like right on a street, like not in a mall or anything. And I used to go to that store whenever I could because it was full of records. And I couldn't afford to buy a record. So I would go to the cutout bin. Yeah. That's where the good stuff was. Yeah, and the cutout bins, like, you know, there were ones that they had opened that was maybe a new band and they were trying to give some exposure to. Maybe the label paid the stores to do that or they asked the stores. to. I don't know what the rules were then. I found out what the rules were when I was on RCA. <laughs> But and there were a lot of them. But yeah, so I'd go through that bin because those records were like five ninety eight. You could take a gamble, right? Yeah. The cool thing was this little store would play the record for you in the store. So I'm going through there and I see this record and I'm like, holy crap, you know? Because if you remember the first album cover, that Van Halen cover was pretty cool. Like it was like, holy shit. It was like a great cover. Got cooler when you turned it over and Dave's there. <laughs> yeah. I was like, what is this Von Holland like? And I showed it to the girl and she just kind of shrugged her shoulders like, I have no idea what that is. And I was like, can I listen to this? And she said, yeah. So I put it on and I just stood there staring at the record and listening with my jaw dropped. I was like, I'm taking this home. I got six bucks someplace, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and yeah. And I remember I took it home. And I put it on my turntable at home and I listened to it again and I was still in disbelief. And then I called Tim, my buddy Tim. And I was like, dude, there's a new band. I think it's called Von Holland. <laughs> and I don't even know. I don't know what this guy's doing. It's a guitar for sure, but he's doing things I've never heard before. And he was like, what? So he came over and we listened to it and yeah, yeah, it was a great experience. The joys of pre-internet. No Google. No Google. You got to come check this out. This is going to blow your mind. Yeah, you're lucky like that you had a phone, like you could call your friend. You know, you're lucky you had that. 
Awesome, man. Mitch, I'll let you go because I know you've got like some other stuff coming up. But I want to thank you for chatting with us. Congratulations on the new album. Yeah, July 7th is the release date. And you can go to MitchMalloy.com to stay in touch with me, to see what's going on. It's an easy click and it's full of all the videos and everything that I've done and that I'm doing. There's lots of cool stuff with the new record, lots of bonus, good physical media stuff, which yeah. I'm all on board with. Yeah, if you're a vinyl person, we went crazy with this. Is this the first Mitch Malloy album on vinyl? It's the absolute first. How cool is that? At this late hour... <laughs> in my career to have that happen. I, I never thought it would happen. And um, actually, um, Harry Hess from Harem Scarum reached out to me, who I love. We go pretty far back and we're pals. And he's like, are you doing vinyl? And I'm like, no, man, vinyl's a pain in the ass. It's like, it takes forever. It costs a fortune. And do my fans really want vinyl? And I knew I did have some fans that did want it. So he talked me into it, basically. He basically made me an offer. He's with this company called Sing, which is a new label. Canadian guys who really know what they're doing. Really good guys. He made me an offer I could not refuse. So it set the release pretty far back. But I thought, you know, so what? We'll have vinyl and that'll be cool. And it's just an extra thing to have. Is your daughter into vinyl? Is she into music? And like all these kids are into like vinyl stuff. She's really into music. She's 15 now and she's not into vinyl. That hasn't been anything that she's even inquired about. I mean, we'd get her a record player if she really wanted one, but we don't even have one. So, I, you know, I think I'm going to have to get one because I have an LP coming. Yeah. Look what dad did. Yeah. So do you have do you have the list in front of you of what's in the bundle? I know there's a poster, there's an 8x10, there's a guitar pick, which is always cool. You get the CD in there, and there's also the golden ticket. Yes, the golden ticket. So uh, there's a few people that win a live Zoom concert with me, okay? But I also did two songs acoustic. Two of the songs off the record, I did them acoustic in my studio on video just for the bundle. So those are the only people that get that. The people who buy the bundle are the only people that get those videos. Very exclusive then. Yeah, very exclusive. And everything's signed. All the CDs that are in the bundle are signed. All the LPs that are in the bundle are signed. So yeah, it's really cool. I wish you nothing but success with it. And I hope you get to come to the UK and play my 50th birthday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Book it now. Start calling venues, dude. Come on, let's go. Book the flights. <laughs> <laughs> the flights won't be bad. Come on. <laughs> All right, man. You enjoyed the rest of your day. It's been very cool to talk to you, man. Good to see you again. Thank you, sir. Big thanks to the legend that is Mitch Malloy for coming along to hang on the Straight to Video podcast. Really was awesome to connect and hopefully at some point we can maybe get him back on the show as I only scratch the surface on the stuff I wanted to learn about. The new album, The Last Song, is out on the 7th of July and if you head on over to MitchMalloy.com you can find all the links on how to order your copy along with all the exclusive bundles and extra stuff that is available. Also, please check out the documentary Van Halen's Lost Boy on YouTube and you can also hear the Mitch Malloy Van Halen collaboration it's the right time which is a killer tune the summer is eating up and saw things at the straight to video 80s video shop in Alfreton, derbyshire we're in the planning stages to celebrate our very first birthday at the end of july so i hope some of you can come along and join us in that we have some new youtube stuff in the works and we've just launched some cool membership packs which are a great way to support the shop for all the info please head on over to www.80svideoshop.co.uk so that is all for today's show as always i truly appreciate you listening and i'll be back next friday with a brand new episode but until Until then, always be kind, please rewind and unwind, and I'll speak to you all real soon.